All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, The Demographic uh, Imperative, Developing the Gerontological Social Work Workforce in New York City and Beyond. My name is Ilana Kiefer. I'm the Acting Director at the Center for Healthy Aging at the New York Academy of Medicine. Um, and this event is co-sponsored by two sections um, at the NIAM Fellows Office, the social work section and the healthy aging section. And we're so happy uh, that you are joining us today. Uh, next slide, please. So I just wanna say a quick word about the vision for NIAM. As some of you may know, the New York Academy of Medicine has improved communities health by driving systems change for 175 years grounded in a vision that everyone should have the opportunity to live a healthy life niam generates knowledge to inform policy and programs including research on the 65 plus population and the professionals who work with them at niam center for healthy aging niam also works collaboratively with local partners on community driven solutions and engages the public to achieve its mission uh, which of course is to drive progress towards health equity and in addition to our over 2,000 fellows and members who are preeminent experts in health-related fields, NIAM has several grant and fellowship programs to support the pipeline of early career professionals in health and medicine. Next slide. So today we are going to hear from an esteemed panel of experts who are devoted to the field of gerontological social work. You can see here, um, and you saw in the emails that you received about this event, um, that we will be hearing from Dr. Patricia Kolb, Dr. Jana Heyman, Bing G, Dr. Martha Sullivan, and then I will wrap us up and we'll take you on quite a journey related to uh, this topic. If you would like to ask a question, um, we ask that you use the Q&A button on the bottom of the Zoom screen. You've probably done this about a thousand times by now. And at the end of the webinar, we will um, take the best questions and bring them to our panelists to answer them. Um, this is a webinar format, so we unfortunately cannot see or hear you, but we can read your questions and we look forward to them. And feel free to type them in throughout uh, the next hour and some change. And I think we can go to the next slide. Yes. So what we're going to do is before we get to our esteemed panel, we're going to take a couple of poll questions so we can better understand who is here today. So if you can run the first poll, please, and you can see it on the PowerPoint as well. What is your position in the field of social work? Select all that apply. I am a practicing social worker. I am a social work student. I teach social work in an undergrad or graduate program um, or other. So just take a few seconds to fill that in. Okay, we're gonna close that poll. And then Joey, if you can run the results so we can see what we have. All right, so it looks like, okay, the, I'm a practicing social worker, about half of the attendees. Um, one person right now is a social work student. Um, a few of you teach are teaching and then the other half are other. Wonderful, so that's quite a wide range, that, that's great. All right, so we'll close that one and then we'll go to the next slide and the next poll, please. Uh, do you currently work in your professional setting with older adults? The choices are yes, almost exclusively, sometimes, but I don't focus specifically on older adults or rarely. Thank you. Okay. Final answer, great, yep, and run the results so we can get a sense. Okay, once again, pretty evenly split. About half of you, yes, almost exclusively, about 30% sometimes, and 25% rarely. So this is good. We have um, some diversity here, so that's wonderful. You can close that poll, thank you. Uh, next slide. So we're gonna turn it over to our first panelist, Dr. Patricia Cole, um, who works at Lehman College, and I will turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Alana. I am privileged to be able to 
be a part of this presentation. And the reason why I feel privileged to do this is because almost my entire social work career, which is a very long career, is in gerontological social work. And I have experience in many facets of this work, direct practice, over 20 years, many years of direct practice, both in community programs, providing services to older adults still living in the community, and also in nursing homes. I've also had administrative experience. I have had a lot of experience supervising students and teaching students and direct, developing curricula in the area of gerontological social work. Um, and some people tell me that when I talk about my work in this field, I'm so enthusiastic that it makes people want to do it. So I'm hoping to do that today. So I don't have slides. I'm just going to talk. And this is almost more of a testimonial in terms of work in the field of gerontological social work is great. Now, it's not for everybody. And I don't think that people should work in the field with older adults unless they really like older people. And a lot of people don't like older people. And I'm not sure why, but they need to consider that older adults are individuals. And many people consider the older adult population, which is more or less people 60 and over. By some definitions, it's uh, 65 and older. Sometimes it's thought of as 70 and older. And gerontologists classify like the young old, the middle old, the old old, depending on ages. But one of the things that we need to think about in terms of working with older adults is not only chronological age, but functional age. Because one's number of years doesn't tell the whole story. And part of what I know from having worked in the field and studied in the field and done research is that it's an extraordinarily diverse population. Some people say that it's the most diverse population of any age group because of the diversity of life experiences because everyone's an individual. And there are lots of stereotypes about older adults. There are too many stereotypes and generally negative stereotypes. And that sometimes influences people's interest in working with older adults, but it's a diverse population. You know, there are older people who I've worked with as a, as a social worker who I really haven't liked very much. So I can't say that I've liked all my clients. And, and I think that if we're honest in terms of our career experiences in the field, we may not have liked all of our social work clients, but if we're good professionals, then we maintain professional objectivity and do the best work possible using our professional practice skills, regardless of how we might feel subjectively about the person. And we need to have self-awareness in terms of our work with older adults, just as with everybody. So there are a lot of, uh, part of what I've said also gave you a sense of the range of fields, of the range of sites and practice areas where one can work with older adults. Sometimes people think, well, I don't wanna work with older adults because they're all confused and have dementia and they're dying, and they're sick, and that's not true, you know? And a lot of people are living to very old age, very healthy. Sometimes people think, well, I don't wanna be a social worker working with older adults because you can't really help them because their ideas are fixed, they can't change. That's part of the stereotypes because older adults can change and they can learn. I've worked in my own practice and also in working with students. I've done a lot of student supervision and advisement in placements having to do with later adulthood. Many people work with people well into their 90s who, who make changes if they decide they wanna make those changes. You know, I, and I wanna give one example. 
one of the one of the student advisees I had who was in my seminar at Lehman College had a placement with older adults in a community program. One of her clients was a woman in her 90s whose son had died decades earlier in the Vietnam War. And she had never really addressed her grief related to that loss. And, and, and she was in her 90s and it had been years. And during that year, the social work student who was working with her was able to help her to be able to talk about her feelings about that loss and come to terms with the loss, arrive at some resolution of the loss of her son. And that's the kind of work that we can do. Sometimes people say, well, you can't do clinical work with older people. Well, what is clinical? People define clinical very differently. But if we're talking about in-depth work with people around psychological challenges, yeah, you could do it. That was an example of that. Um, and two, so- Two minutes, Pat. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so rushing through the rest of this really, really quickly, um, those are a couple of the things I thought it was most important to say. Sometimes we refer, refer to it as geriatric social work. Sometimes there's confusion about terms. Usually it's more often referred to as geriatrics in medical settings, in gerontology, more, li in geronto more likely gerontology in other settings. Sometimes we just say we work with older adults and all that's really important. You don't have to, if you're a student who's about to graduate, one of the things I said to a group of graduating students and with their MSWs in one of my courses recently was, you don't have to know already what you're gonna do in social work. I was gonna have a career working with kids. My field work placements were with kids, never thought about working with older adults. Just follow where your career takes you. Give it a chance. I had the opportunity in a year and a half out of social work school to work with older adults as a program director. I hadn't even thought about that. I was fascinated by the stories. I was fascinated by the people. I have learned and grown so much from working in this field of practice. And I also know that I've been able to help you, help, help, help older adults. So consider different options. And if you're already wanting to do this, go for it. It can be a rewarding career. Thank you for listening. And thank you for your cheerleading, Dr. Kolb, and all of your work in this field. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. And we will hear from Dr. Heyman um, at the Henry C. Ravizen Center on Aging and Intergenerational Studies at Fordham University. Take it away. Thank you so much, Lena. And thank you, Pat, for really stimulating us to think about our work with older adults. And if we go to the next slide, I'm going to give you a very quick snapshot on what I see as some of the new old age, the research and innovations, and some of the work for social workers. Next slide, please. So the focus of the presentation is on demographics. You have to click on these slides. So on demographics and research and talking about COVID-19. And on the next group is to really talk about how they are going to change. So it's really what is the new age. And the second part is really going to talk about some of the innovations in the field, technology, intergenerational and building communities. And if you look at that, that can really help to open up our eyes about opportunities and what we can learn from new initiatives. Next slide, please. When we look about and I'm asking you to step back a moment, step back a moment in history and really just look at how age has changed, how we see aging. And when we look at the age throughout life expectancy throughout history, we see a shift. And we're seeing that with um, in the 1850s, 
And here we have an interesting data I tried to merge without COVID, unfortunately, we would have been at a life expectancy of 78.6, but a recent report that came out later in 2020 said COVID impact older adults and the way that we age. And hopefully in the later work and all the efforts that have been going on, we will continue to improve on life expectancy, but COVID has affected us. And next slide, please. If we go to some of the things that we've learned in recent research, we learned that the COVID-19 pandemic has the potential not only to impact life expectancy, and but it's because of the way it has affected older adults. And older adults are in need of your help and social workers, medical, healthcare professionals to really build and to help strengthen the needs of older adults and their families. Next slide, please. So just building on some of the things that Pat Cole mentioned, I mean, she really talked about the myths of aging. And here are some of the top ones that came out is that older people can't learn new things. And there you were, Dr. Cole, right up there. We see that these are myths. These are myths of depression and loneliness are normal. Eventually older adults get dementia. Most older adults have similar needs. Older adults can't exercise creativity and making a contribution is for the young. Yet, we look at all the work that is being done every day and older adults are really pushing and really changing the way the world is. And they are doing new things and they are changing. And there's so many opportunities for growth. Next slide, please. And so we know also that we have to be cognizant that not all older adults have similar needs. And when Dr. Cope was talking, we're thinking, really recognizing as individuals, individual needs. While some people may feel isolated and lonely during the pandemic, others, older adults said this was a time for them to grow and learn new things and other challenges. And they've become, even better and more equipped in technology. Um, just recently, I was working with a group of people and the older adult was teaching me new things on technology and, and services. So it's fascinating as you, as you move forward on this. Next slide, please. So I'd like you to think about innovation and change as we move on and we think about those challenges. Next slide. And they do affect social, economic, educational, political, and well being. Next slide. So, in economics, yes, older adults, some of them need to work for financial reasons, and some older adults want to work. So, when you're thinking of older adults, think about the reflection that economics does play a role. And sometimes it's very important that older adults feel and are part of society for making change and having input. Next slide. Also, older adults can be very and have been really building their strengths and resources in creative arts. And this has been a growth for, the, for older adults, including visual arts, music, and theater. And some of the examples, and I've worked with a number of older adults on projects over the years that include singing, memoirs, artistics, such as quilting, painting. And research has shown that creative arts can impact everyone, can impact older adults, can impact their families, and has shown that it really changes the way we as society perceive health and well being. And the need for this innovation and being aware, being really aware and understanding that there are opportunities for, for field placements that engage older adults in a range of these services. Next slide, please. And as I talked about technology, I can't help really reflect on how intergenerational programming has totally changed the way that we have done health and wellness today. Right now, partnerships with health departments, Office for the Aging, universities have helped to strengthen program for older adults. 
Last Monday, I was in a senior center and the older adults were really being part of a technology program. And I have to say, they were learning technology, but they also were doing a health and wellness check with technology. Developing this with a intergenerational lens has really grown, has grown throughout the United States. Um, the um, Gerontological Society of America has just been spotlighting all these innovations in intergenerational programming where older adults are working with young people to improve their use of technology and to share a piece of history, share a piece of knowledge, understand and explore opportunities through book clubs, through reading programs. And technology is the wave of the future as it we see every day, but it's also the way of building relationships. Next slide, please. And when we look at these ideas about the impact, we see virtual visits during COVID has helped to connect older adults, has helped to improve and monitor health and wellness progress. And also uh, something that we just heard about older adults and, and really perceptions, sometimes building the the partnership with older adults and young people can help to change attitudes and interests and advocacy work and influence policies and changes for the future. So for many older adults, programs that connect young people with older adults help them feel empowered, both the youth as well as older adults. Next Two minutes. Slide. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so intergenerational programs, we've been sparking a lot of ideas and innovations with them. Um, I do wanna mention um, a lot of programs in um, senior centers have really grown and strengthened. I've been working also um, over the years with Gerote right in New York City. Many of you have heard of them. They match older adults with young people and provide a range of friendly visiting and other services that are very exciting and build that bond. Next slide, please. And so when we're thinking about social work, the thinking about the future, overall employment of social workers is projected to grow 12%. And this is from the 2022 April 19th report. So it's fresh off the um, news bulletin here. Um, and it talks about it is growing faster than average of all occupations and openings for social workers are projected each year. And some of these are right in health and wellness and working with older adults. So we need change and we need you and involvement and opportunities for other field placements. And the next slide, please. So in summary, think about the changing demographics, think about your, your family, your um, what you see in society, changing works and lifestyle, what we see and hear on the news and around us, and new ways to stay involved and active in, in gerontology. And look at all of new innovative community initiatives that have really helped to sponsor and grow and provide rich resources for our older adults and communities. Thank you so much. And I am very excited to hear the coming speakers that are next. Thank you so much, wonderful. Uh, next slide, please. All right, and now we're gonna turn it over to Bing Ji, who is the director of Village View Nork, a naturally occurring retirement community and works at University Settlement. Thank you, um, and thank you, Alana, for spelling out the Nork. Uh, that saved some work for me. Uh, so, hi, everyone. It's so wonderful and exciting to be here and see many of you who are already in the field working with older adults or, or interested in coming to this field, working uh, with folks who are older. Um, so I, um, I was given the task to make this very exciting so that eventually everybody would want to work with older adults. Um, so what I wanted to do is to really um, provide a closer look for how and give you more context of how does that look like on the ground in a day to day sort of um, lifetime thing. Uh, next slide please. 
So to begin, uh, oh, next slide, please. To begin, I wanted to give you, I'll talk a little bit about our agency actually to give you, give you more context, like I said, um, so that you know why, where I'm coming from and why I'm here and why this is exciting. So I work at University Solomon, which is the first Solomon house and this classic Solomon house. So you've learned about the Solomon movement, you've heard about it and that's us and we're still here. Um, we've been around for over 135 years. And in our older doll section, we have some classic city funded programs like the NORC, uh, like older adult centers slash senior centers. And we have some innovative ones where the ideas and, and funding come from our own. But overall, our work is really focused on the older adults who are still living in the community, not ready or don't want to go to institutional care, which is actually the majority, super majority of older adults that we see in the city. Uh, so that's my context. And uh, the day-to-day -day work in our agency, our field, um, looks like a few buckets, right? It looks like case management or case assistance. It looks like activities, uh, some groups, some uh, trips, some uh, exercise classes, technology classes, and some advocacy work. So that's, that's to hopefully to help you to picture our day-to-day. And we have tons of case-related or non-case-related interactions from casual ones. What did you eat for lunch? Or really like clinical, deeper counseling type of conversations like what Dr. Cope just mentioned uh, in the example. Next slide, please. So now we have the context. I wanted to talk about what's unique about um, the gerontological work that look like in the community level. First of all, it's very inclusive. And I say inclusive because, you know, this life stage um, is really when people started, while they have their day-to-day -day thing going on, they started to reflect on their life. And this reflection really makes this group very interesting to work with because they're so experienced. They have so much to share. They have so much wonderful stories. And they also have a lot of unresolved loss, unresolved trauma. So that makes this work very, very interactive. We're talking about working with people, partnering with people. I think this age group really allows you to feel that way instead of working for people or working on something. So that's a big difference that I feel on a daily life, uh, daily working life. So you feel this, this true partnership in here, in this job. So that's what I meant by inclusive. Uh, the second one is very interesting. It's a very uh, concrete, practical, social worky type of thing that you get to know everything about benefits and entitlements because older adults is in this age group that's really heavy on entitlements and the benefits. There are a lot of programs going on. There are a lot of need for more programs going on. And we're talking about all kinds of different, um, including social, social security, Medicaid and Medicare, all that, you name it. So when we work in this field, naturally, we get a lot of understanding, a lot of knowledge about benefits and entitlements. So that actually, at least for me, gives me a closer look of how policy runs in this country and how policymakers make decisions, what they want to really work on when, we when, when they make certain policies. So when we talk about people wanting to not knowing what exactly what they wanted to do and want to change career later on, and this field really gives us, I think, a very good headway about policy work, about systemic, <clears throat> excuse me, systemic changes, systemic advocacy work. Um, and just to tell you that I got, I, I talking to researchers all the time, like Dr. Heyman says, she works with many older adult centers. So that also gives us some ideas about how research works. We got to contribute to research. Um, and like Dr. Cope's example, you got to touch very, very deep clinically. So it touches everything on the third point that's showing up here. It, it really gives me at least an understanding of how advocacy looks like, how research looks like, how clinical practice looks like from this older adult perspective. So I know actually better which way I wanted to go. 
So that's another unique thing about this field. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, and this is also something that interesting that I realized after years working with older adults, that this age group is very unique in this intersection of biopsychosocial, um, how do I say it? Um, sweet spot, right? So this is the age group where many people have chronic conditions. They manage chronic conditions. So they have a little bit of extra work to do other than just going to work, just being a kid, just going to school. <clears throat> I'm not saying that other groups are not dealing with this, but this is a little bit more common with older adults than with other groups. So then as social workers, I not only got to really go deeper on the cycle and social perspective, but I got to work with the medical field a lot. I have to work with the physical condition a lot just because the nature of who, who my clientele is. And that a lot of times is a fun. And also I got to meet with a lot of different people um, in my working experience and, and also spark different type of ideas because on, in addition to work with many other social workers, I got to work with many doctors and nurses and, and you know, and people work in hospitals and, and clinical settings. And then the last thing about uniqueness about this field is we got to do something fun all the time. And, and the fun, when I say something fun, it, it meant two things, right? So A is in our community setting, at least, we got to work on like organizing some parties, organizing some activities, organ organizing some intergenerational activities. So that itself, in itself, is really fun and rewarding. And on the other hand, at the individual level, because we're constantly exploring and finding out and realizing how amazing this person is in front of us. So we constantly think about different ways working with this person. For example, we had a participant whom we filmed her teaching people how to make Christmas wreaths with closing hangers and how to make Valentine's Day gifts with chocolate and really like regular household stuff. And she was also able to speak from, speak from somebody who has arthritis. So she knows how to make those things even with arthritis. So she has a whole, whole lot of tricks and to teach people how to do that. We have her on YouTube. Being two so minutes. Just, thank you. So mm -hmm. just amazing to get to work with somebody like this and to explore different ideas to make this, this, this work more fun. Uh, next slide, please. So what is the learning experience like? Um, well, this was this question was geared towards more like a student body, but I just wanted to talk in general about how this work experience looked like. Um, the first first one, of course, it challenges my understanding of who older adults are and how aging looks like all the time. We have students years after years when we ask them to reflect towards the end of their internship, the first thing they say is, wow, this really changes my understanding. I thought older adults are X, Y, and Z, and turns out they're not. Um, and it's just something that is hard to, to realize without working with them. And you can immediately see that once you start interacting with folks. So that's number one. And we talked about number two already about benefits and entitlements. And then the third thing is just supervision and engagement really happen in many forms and in many places. And that makes it fun. Uh, sorry, next slide. I know my time is up. I have a timer as well. Um, and I wanted to really touch on this number four point because we're collect collectively battling ageism by individually working with people, challenging their perception of being burdensome and useless. And eventually we as individuals, we make our future better because we make the future of older adults better. So when we get older, it's better already, right? Thank you everyone.
Thank you so much, Bing. Thank you so much. Um, if Bing hasn't sold you on the pluses of field placements in this field, I'm not sure what will, so thank you. And I'm gonna turn it over now to Dr. Sullivan. Yep, just unmute yourself. I know, class, yep. That's a good there thing. There we go. Unmute. <laughs> so good afternoon, um, everyone. I'm Martha Sullivan. Um, I serve as executive director to a very large public uh, state psychiatric center, and I am the founder and CEO of the Citywide Behavioral Health Coalition for Black Elders, Inc. Um, I am also an elder myself and have served as a caregiver for uh, both of my parents and uh, I guess we could say assistant caregiver for uh, my husband who was caregiver for his uh, great aunt. Um, I wanna thank also Alana Kiefer and Niam for organizing the presentation this afternoon um, and our co-sponsoring section, Social Work and Healthy Aging, both of which I am a member. Uh, so if we can go to the next slide, please. And then to the next one. There we are. Great, so um, at the outset, I would like to say that our very topic today indicates that social work practice with older adults is a special field of practice. And that as we attempt to meet the challenge of developing this specialty workforce, we will need to attend to diversity. We need a diverse workforce in order to provide culturally appropriate services. And we also need to challenge ourselves, although we'll be talking about uh, the diversity of the workforce today, we also need to challenge ourselves not to stop there if we want to truly be uh, providing services that are culturally appropriate. Uh, the staffing issue is, is the first essential step, but only one step. Uh, we know that culturally appropriate care is really a matter of quality and patient experience as well. And as we work increasingly with elders of color and elders from marginalized or oppressed ethnic groups, we're also going to need to address issues of ageism and racism. Next, please. So, too often older adults unique development is unaddressed. So here I'm speaking obviously of services and programs that are not specific aging uh, services. Um, and yet we know that older adulthood is a specific stage in life that has its unique psychosocial issues and tasks. As social workers, we certainly all know that. Um, later life families as well um, and a later life family is a family with an older member, have specific developmental functions and tasks. Uh, so again, we, as social workers, we've all studied the work of Eric Erickson. Um, most likely, I hope people are familiar with the work of Monica McGoldrick, Timothy Brubaker, uh, from a Walsh, who've also looked at this, the family systems issues um, around how the family functions in dealing with the tasks of older adulthood, right? Such as grandparenthood, retirement, dealing with chronic illness and so forth. That's neat. Diverse New Yorkers. Um, I think we all know that yes, there is global aging. And when we look closer to home, um, certainly we see that in New York state, Almost 17% of the population of New York State are people who are age 60 and over. Um, bringing it even closer to home in New York City, almost half of those elders live in New York City. And then if we look at the racial and ethnic diversity, um, we know that the elders of color are the fastest growing cohorts of the older adult population. And uh, what you may not be as aware of is that Asian and Pacific Islanders, if we look at the period from 20, 2000 to 2019, Asian and Pacific Islanders population 
has increased almost 200%, followed by Hispanic elders and Black elders. So what this demography actually indicates is not only uh, the growth of elders of color, it's also really saying that all of us who are gerontological social workers should be prepared to work cross-culturally. Next slide, please. And uh, Black elders, by the way, in New York City, approximately 20% of New York City's older adult population are Black elders. So just a word or two about cultural appropriateness. And I'm using the term cultural appropriateness to encompass cultural competence and cultural humility. So cultural competence, I think we're all familiar. It's about understanding and providing care that attends to cultural and linguistic differences. The cultural humility, when you think about the diversity that I just mentioned, says that yes, um, we really have to recognize that um, number one, there are, there's lots of variation of cultures that we need to learn about. We can't know it all. So we have to be constantly assuming a uh, stance of learning about new cultures. And number two, and I think uh, Dr. Colby, you alluded to this earlier, even once we think that we have some understanding of the specific culture or ethnic background of the person in front of us, there's always that uniqueness of the individual. So we will have to learn about that individual that we are working with. Next slide, please. So we've talked really about the intersection of the cultures of age and uh, race and ethnicity. Um, I, I will certainly say, as was one of the presenters mentioned earlier, there are so many other dimensions of difference that we're, I'm not focusing on here, but just for the sake of time, these two. But we also have to look at the intersection of ageism and racism, right? And I, I'm selecting just one uh, issue, which is invisibility, that too often older adults are invisible and too often people of color are rendered invisible. So one, uh, I think very graphic recent example is the COVID-19 pandemic. So it's very well known that old, older adults are at greater risk for the virus, coronavirus. And it's pretty well known that the black community has also been uh, especially hard hit by the coronavirus. In fact, the mortality rate for black Americans is double our representation in the population. So why is it that the focus on how the virus has impacted black elders is so scant? The reality is that while black elders represent 9% of the population that is 65 and over, that they are 21% of the older people who are dying from the virus. And that's a very little known fact and focus. So it's very important as we look at the demographics of our, uh, our services and our programs that we look at these intersections, right? So we look at, um, we ask ourselves, how are Latino elders accessing our services? Um, are there outcome disparities when we consider Asian American elders using our programs? Or how are black men older black men faring in our programs. Next slide, please. Two so, minutes. Yes, okay. So when we look at recruitment strategies, um, one way I think about it is interest, knowledge, and experience. Because we're seeking to develop professionals who have the interest. And I agree with you completely, Dr. Colby, everyone doesn't have the interest to work with our population, nor any other population, right? We, we have our preferences, uh, but we're seeking to develop professionals who have the interest, the knowledge and the experience to provide this specialty care that is culturally appropriate for diverse older adults. And I am going to call out one of the attendees at the today's program. Um, I believe she's uh, online. 
um, Kathy Martinez, who I think is a, a perfect example of this because um, I met Kathy as uh, when she was a social work intern. And, um, and speaking with Kathy recently, uh, Ms. Martinez, she said that, you know, so, social, I'm sorry, working with older adults was in her blood, right? Um, it was instilled by her relationship with her grandmother. Her grandmother also took her with her volunteering to work with other older adults. So this was an experience she had uh, growing up. It was a seed that her, you could say her grandmother planted, um, but that seed was nurtured by her internships and the experiences she had in social work school. And Ms. Martinez is now the executive director of a neighborhood shop in the Bronx one of the largest uh, social service agencies in uh, the Bronx. And, and we're really very proud of her. So I think that that brings home a lot of what um, uh, the presenters have been saying earlier. Next slide, please. So we need to cultivate interest. And uh, one of the ways that we can cultivate interest is task assignments for students. So, um, the Citywide Behavioral Health Coalition for Black Elders, for example, has had students work with us as a task or secondary assignment. And it's been extremely helpful to the coalition and also beneficial for the student. So even a student who is primarily interested in casework or clinical work um, may also just have some uh, thought that they have a perhaps budding interest in working with older adults um, or an interest in administration because to work with the coalition, they learn uh, administrative processes and intervention, interventions and community work. So uh, task assignments for students, something I think we ought to think about. Um, raising awareness is, is really important because we need to mitigate that invisibility that older adults and elders, uh, elders of color often experience. Uh, and we can do this by just gathering and disseminating age demographic data from our agencies, which is usually pretty readily available uh, and including age cohorts. Uh, one program that did this found that one third of their clients were age 65 and over. And quite frankly, they had not realized that. And that really stimulated them to want to focus more on developing their knowledge of gerontological practice. Um, with regard to knowledge development, um, another example is we developed a geriatric enhancement task force and just asked for volunteers, whoever wanted to join. Well, 35 staff signed up to join the task force. Um, the task force is using the IHI, Institute for Human for Healthcare Development, I'm sorry, Institute for Healthcare Improvements 4M model. And they're using that model to examine all of the services across the agency and engaging in that way others who are not on the task force to come in and discuss how their programs relate to the 4M model. Um, Ben, you will be also interested in knowing that we decided to um, enhance the model to the 4M plus T and add technology to that. Um, and, um, I, and I should tell you that the development of the task force really um, is attributed to the work of social work interns. It was two years of intern assignments. The first student laid the groundwork by gathering the demographic data and um, basically doing a sort of cross-sectional study of where our older adults were across the agency. And the this next student, the next year, picked up on the work of the first student and actually uh, learned the 4M model and launched the, the task force, which is still operating. Uh, In-service training obviously is extremely important. Um, and the other thing to think about is uh, developing an older adults team amongst your the staff that you already have. So many of these things I'm, I'm bringing to the fore because they use existing resources. People often think 
Where do I have to reach out to? How do I advertise? But sometimes in reaching with your existing resources, because that what I call latent uh, affinity for working with older adults may be there and just needs to be drawn out with some opportunity. So uh, with that, I will close and, and say that uh, I have found working as a gerontological social worker immensely rewarding for myself. And I really am hopeful about our ability to meet the challenge of developing the workforce that we so much need. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. And I particularly like that concept of cultural humility. Um, and I was thinking it also can be applied for age humility and yes. recognizing that just because you have two 75 year olds, they, that, yes. that does not mean that they're the same person. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. And in fact, Alana, I think when you think about the intersection just of age and uh, culture, right? So there's so many variations of how people from the same culture, yeah. um, their preferences may be different according to the age cohort. Mm, yep. Right? Absolutely. So. All right, thank you. We'll go to the next slide. Um, so now I'm gonna do just a quick review of some resources. We wanna make sure that you walk away with some tangible ways of advancing and sharing um, this field. So you can go to the next slide. So we are very lucky in this great city of New York to have so many different social work programs that have um, concentrations or certificates um, in aging. So you can see these various schools listed here. I may have even missed some. I'm not gonna go through each of them, but many of our esteemed panelists um, teach at these different schools and have perhaps attended some of these schools. And this is just for New York City. I hope that we have some people on here outside of the Big Apple. And um, there are certainly programs around the country, social work programs, both undergrad and graduate that do um, where you are able to uh, either focus on aging or take courses on gerontological social work. Um, and we're happy to, you know, communicate with you after this webinar um, to look those up if we've piqued your interest enough. Um, and we will send out these slides at the tomorrow and each of these links will take you to these different programs. Next slide. And I hope that you've kind of taken as we've all been talking and sharing information that there are, we know that the field placement is a very important piece of the social work education. And you can see here, and as we've all been talking about, there are so many different ways um, to have field placements that interact with older adults and older clients. It's not just, let's say, oh, if I wanna be a gerontological social worker, I need to do a field placement at my local nursing home. You certainly can, but there are so many different ways um, that you can have that type of experience. And here we've listed just some of them. So we just want you to be thinking in that kind of more creative way that we hope we've come across. Uh, next slide. And also, because we are here hosted by NIAM, we of course need to tell you about some of our resources at the Center for Healthy Aging that may also kind of you know, promote this and help you as you're learning more about this. So I know this screen is a little um, wild over here, but this is a screen talking about an interactive mapping tool that we have at the Center for Healthy Aging called Image NYC. You can see here, uh, this map allows the visualization of local data to address the unmet needs of the 65 plus population and to help plan for the future. So you've seen in some of these slides actually, we're not only thinking about the older adults of today, but also the older adults of tomorrow. And um, these population is going to grow and live longer and live healthier. And um, we wanna make sure that we have a workforce that is ready, willing and able um, to work with the older population today and tomorrow. And this map can help show that again um, for all of those different kind of stages. So we hope that you will check out our map. We have uh, free training sessions available. We're also meeting with city councilors, particularly members of the New York City Council Aging Committee so that they know that this map is available and can help in their planning for their districts. Um, and this map is publicly available and free and we welcome any feedback on the map. Next slide, please. 
We also um, have something called the Older Adults Equity Collaborative, OAEC, uh, which is part of a grant, a, a grant from the Administration for Community Living, uh, which is a federal grant that we have here at the Center for Healthy Aging, which allows us to work with five different national nonprofit organizations across the country that are focusing on different uh, minority populations within the aging and caregiving uh, field. And so these different organizations fo focus on Black older adults, Hispanic older adults, Asian American, Pacific Islander older adults, uh, I'm saying uh, Native American older adults and the LGBT older adult population. You might hear sirens, apologies for that. This is New York City. Um, and we also have a resource library. And this is again, free publicly available. All of the resources on our resource library, you can see the hyperlink there are all related to aging specifically for my within minority populations so we encourage you to check those um, check those out next slide please and i also just want to uh, briefly touch on this um, the frameworks institute which is an organization um, has a whole kind of curriculum related to this new this not new but this concept called reframing aging we could have many other webinars on this topic, so I'm not going to go into detail about it, but I encourage you to check out the link to learn more about it. Um, there are many kind of teaching tools related to this, and it's really, as I hope we've also come across, really um, hoping to shift the conversation in how we talk about aging and older adults. Um, and I will um, stop there because there's so much to say about that, and we want to make sure we get to questions. Next slide. All right, so we have come to the Q&A portion. We have about 15 minutes for that. So I hope that you are putting your questions in. And I already saw a first one. So if my panelists can please unmute themselves, we're gonna go to the first question, which is from Kirsten Wyatt. And the question is, and this is a perfect question for Niam, um, but I'm gonna let you all answer it. What are some policy changes that you think would be most beneficial for older adults? Who would like to take that one on? Jana? I could, I could just start with some of the, 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 the information that we know is so critical. And I think for older adults, a lot of it is about improving Medicare coverage, um, mm -hmm. like hearing, um, also improving Medicaid coverage. Um, and these have very significant implications for addressing the needs of older adults, having to do with drug pricing, having to do with cost sharing. But how can we really advocate for older adults and policy changes that can address the needs that are so important for the many older adults' lives? And then I do think there's a need to continue to move for a lot of our older adults are seen at um, services that are either funded by government or funded um, by programs that are through grants that are short lived. And how can we do and support initiatives right here in New York State, but equally throughout our country that expands other services to offer um, older adults. And I could go on for a while about that, but I let other panelists jump in as well. Well, one thing I would add is we really need to look at age discrimination in the workplace. Uh, one of the presenters uh, mentioned that many older adults are working because they would like to work. They would like to continue to work. And uh, despite the fact that social workers, we get to work many, very often with people who have needs or, or problems, there's also the reality that people are aging better now as a result mm -hmm. of all the things that we've learned about how to uh, take care of people better, right? So many people find that they reach the quote unquote retirement age, but they're not ready to retire and actually have tremendous experience that's valuable and needed. Uh, but ageism in the workplace, I think, is a sort of a hidden and uh, unaddressed issue mm -hmm. that needs attention. Yep. Mm -hmm. I've sometimes caught students who questions older adults continuing to work who said well older people should retire and make places for 
for younger people. And yeah. I think one of the things to keep in mind is that it's a social justice issue. Mm -hmm. You know that for most jobs, it's not legal in the United States, thanks decades ago to Maggie Kuhn and the Grey Panthers, that legislation went through Congress so that for most jobs, it's not, it's not legal to fire someone because of their age. And it's true that sometimes organizations find ways to, to make it so uncomfortable for people right. Right. that they want to leave. Right. But we need to be vigilant about that and keep in mind that older people have so much to offer and so much experience. And often everybody can benefit from some of those individuals being able to continue to be in their jobs. Yes. And I think um, the, the idea that the pie is only so big mm. is, is a strategy that we shouldn't, we shouldn't yes. fall into that belief, right? Yes. We just had data that showed us social work is wide open. Social workers are greatly needed. Yes. And that's going to be a trend for quite a while. And, mm -hmm. and part of what's driving that trend is the elder boom. <laughs> so, yeah. right. right. So there's no need for a younger social worker to feel like an older social worker who continues to work is a, an impediment to them. And that's actually a good uh, lead into our next question from Millie Gonzalez. Are you finding an increase of students that are interested in working with older adults, especially for those of you who work um, in a school setting? Um, you know, I am very excited because this year we had a student led group on aging that really started to um, recruit and plan for careers in aging. And that just gave me such wonderful hope for the future because we've had small groups before, but this was um, a, a larger group of students that wanted to really talk to their peers and that are just starting out. Many of the students were going towards graduation. So they wanted to talk with some of the students that are just starting their MSW education. And I have to be honest, I was thrilled. I was so excited mm. that they really <laughs> led the conversation and I was yeah. there along for, you know, the, the ride. And, and it was, it was just a, a, a sense of growth and hope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I, I, go, go ahead, Bing. Oh, I'm not ahead, sure Bing. About, about the numbers, but I know that at Lehman College, where several years ago, uh, we developed an interdisciplinary gerontology minor, interdepartmental. So it's available to people in different departments. We don't have a required minor in the social work program. And this is an undergraduate minor. But uh, even though a, a minor is not required, we have many, many, we fill up classes, mm. elective courses in gerontology, um, in social work and in sociology and some other fields with students who are really interested in learning more about work with older adults and about what that's like. And so I'm not sure about the numbers, but that's been sustained. Mm. And um, so I think that's, that's exciting. Um, yeah, that is exciting. Uh, Bing, go ahead. Uh, so I was gonna say that it's, um, when I work in the field, not many students would come in and say, oh, I wanted to work with older adults, that's why I'm here. But the exciting news is that when they leave, they become open to work with older adults. Yes. Um, so that's, that's yes. nice. Um, and uh, some of them still, some of them might be still adamant about like working with children or working in blah, blah, blah. Uh, but right. they don't mind talking to their friends about their experiences in, in working with older adults. So to influence their mm -hmm. friends. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, one of the things that I would mention that's related that, um, has been implied in a number of the comments is that, you know, the few research studies that have been done, including one that I did, about interest of students in work in the field of aging and gerontological social work indicates that the key factor is the opportunity 
to be able to feel like a sense of efficacy hmm. that you are able to help an older person. And sometimes that comes from family experiences. Sometimes it's from neighbors in the community. Uh, sometimes it's from field, and place, field placements that students didn't even think they really wanted. But by the end of it, they want to work with older adults or job opportunities. And so having that experience that says that, well, maybe the, maybe the student is much younger than older people, and maybe they think the older people won't let them help them. Or maybe they'll think that they don't have anything to offer to older people. But having the opportunity of feel like you can left of knowing that you've really been able to help an older person can make a very big difference in terms of interest in the field. Absolutely. So I'm going to, going to admit that unlike everybody on this panel, I am not a social worker. And so I saw a question here from Bonnie that said, who is eligible for sci-fi and can schools consider easier access to this, like keeping it online? And I had to look up what sci-fi was. And the first thing I Googled was systemat systemically important financial institution. And I thought that's probably not what Bonnie meant, but then I found, uh, seminar in field instruction. So I assume, Bonnie, wherever you are, that's what you mean. And so I'm now going to ask that question one more time. Um, who is eligible for sci-fi and can schools consider easier access to this, like keeping it online? Yes. Oh, well, I can, and, and, and the way we call it SIFI. Oh, right. there you go, man. Right. But I, I kind of like the way <laughs> I I'm wondering that about that. <laughs> that was great. But I do think a lot of um, the SIFI programs have moved um, to education um, and training. And I, I do feel there's a lot of advantages that have been offered. Um, and I think what's really important too is that some of the universities and colleges are also thinking of doing um, ways that they can partner together to have group supervision through mm. a SIFI leader. So there's a, a lot of innovations that I think have sparked, um, and some of them I will say because of, of COVID, the pandemic kind of changed the, you know, the way that we we thought and worked. I do think it's a valid point. You know, I have had many agencies that you know we wanted to place a student and we needed to have someone that was, you know, approved by, you know, have the SIFI certification. Um, but I think we we are building ways to um, partner and do innovative um, work on that. And I don't know if anybody else want to add to that. I do actually wanted to add that. I can't, I don't think it's appropriate for me to just say it out loud here, but I know some schools are actually willing to hire safety instructors themselves in order to support a student to work in the field placement. So if the field placement does not have the resource nor a safety instructor, they can definitely work with the school. Um, I can tell you offline, Bonnie, which school that is. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, and, it's, it, and I, I, I don't know whether everybody is aware of this, but if you're taking CV course from the school you graduated, you only need to wait for two years post-graduation of MSW instead of three years. Huh. Mm -hmm. oh. and, and, and you just have to take CV course with that school, with the same school you went for MSW, and take a student from that school. As I understand it, and I think this is still true, the curriculum for the SIFI course is a standard curriculum that is used, uh, that has the components required in terms of knowledge for being a field instructor for all of the schools, especially in the metropolitan area. I don't know if that extends beyond the metropolitan area. So that if someone has that SIFI course, say at Lehman College where I teach or at Fordham or one of the other schools that you can also be eligible to be a field instructor at other schools. Right. Right. Got it. 
All right, we are coming down to the end of our webinar. I'm going to ask one more question, uh, which is from Carolyn Messner. Are older adults protected by uh, ADA and FMLA in the workplace? So I think it's American with Disabilities Act and Family and Medical Leave Act. I don't know for sure, but I would assume that they and would it, also with be American disabilities. We just um, we're part of a panel group at Fordham University on American disabilities. And and what we're trying to do is open up, you know, awareness of, you know, for older adults. And I mean, this this really is so important. A great question. So important. And and I think a lot of it is that many people don't realize you know, yeah. enough about the services under this act. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to uh, put my email address in the chat here. Um, and let's see. Oh, and Cheryl says that she earned SIPI and have, oh, hold on one second. She uh, earned SIPI and have supervised students from multiple schools. So if you have questions, please feel free to reach out. That's Cheryl Jaffe. Thank you. Um, I put my email address in the chat and I can direct any questions to any of the panelists from um, all of our um, audience. And yes, we will be sending out the slides and the recording. So we hope that you share it um, with your colleagues and fellow students. And I just wanna thank all of you as wonderful, esteemed panelists, sharing your information and your knowledge today. And I also wanna thank Joey Harper as our amazing behind the scenes IT tech support. And all of you, um, I know it's dinner time, so please, we will wrap up and thank you for joining us. And um, we hope to see you at another NIAM webinar. So thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.